Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here. I'd like to welcome Professor Noah Feldman, who is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at the Harvard Law School. And we're very glad to have him here today uh, to share his, uh, his expertise on law, religion, constitution, and I'm sure many other topics that take a tangent from that. This talk wouldn't have been possible without Dr. Rohan Murthy's help. He has um, enabled it here today. And uh, uh, Rohan Murthy, who is a junior fellow of the Society of Fellows at Harvard, I request him to please come up here and introduce Professor Feldman and also the talk. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's, uh, I, I, in my opinion, I think it's a, it's a real honor for India, for Bangalore, and for Infosys. Um, to have Professor Noah Feldman come spend some time with us and speak to us today. Just by way of sort of introductions about Noah, um, Noah specializes in constitutional studies with particular emphasis on the relationship between law and religion, constitutional design, and the history of legal theory. He is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Um, he's also a senior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard, which is where, when I was a junior fellow, I met Noah. Um, in 2003, he served as a senior constitutional advisor to the coalition provisional authority in Iraq and subsequently advised members of the Iraqi governing council on the drafting of the transitional administrative um, law or interim constitution. Uh, Noah has an undergraduate degree uh, from Harvard he was then a Rhodes Scholar, uh, where he did his PhD at Oxford. Um, and uh, he then got a law degree from Yale. Um, and he was then a junior fellow at the Society Fellows at Harvard. And uh, he was then a law professor at NYU. And then he finally moved to Harvard. Now, this is, you know, in a, in a sense, this is a template of boilerplate stuff that you would say whenever you introduce any academic. But there's something else that is quite extraordinary about Noah that you'll find today, which is, apart from being a brilliant speaker, he has, in, amongst the people that I have met, he has the most extraordinary bandwidth uh, when it comes to sort of intellectual breadth and depth. Um, you, I think the first time I met him, I remember there was, I was just observing, and he was having a heated debate about quantum mechanics with a person who had a PhD in physics. And you know, I think this sort of, you know, his intellectual breadth and depth is perhaps evinced in, in the list of books that he has already published. Even though he's just 45, um, he's published eight books. And I can tell you in the academic world for somebody of age 45 to have published eight books. And I'm going to read the titles of these eight books just to give you a sense of how diverse uh, Noah's thinking is. His most recent book uh, is Cool War, The Future of Global Competition. And prior to that, uh, he, he was part of publishing this book on constitutional law, um, Scorpions, the Battles and Triumphs of FDR's Great Justices, and then A Fall and Rise of the Islamic State. Um, and then he had this very famous uh, New York Times Magazine article, which is on When Judges Make Foreign Policy. Um, and then he had another book on Divided by God, America's Church State Problem and What We Should Do About It. And then he had this other book, which is on What We Owe Iraq, uh, war and the Ethics of Nation Building, and prior to that, um, he had another book on After Jihad, America and the Struggle for Islamic Democracy. So you can see that you know, he really can span a whole different bunch of issues. Um, so uh, today, uh, this is Noah's first visit to India, and almost by definition, first visit to Bangalore. And this is his first talk today, um, which will be uh, which will basically touch on topics uh, to do with uh, the need for a constitution um, and how that, that gets tied into uh, ideas of religion and modernity. And with that, uh, let's please give a really warm round of welcome to Noah. And, uh, Thank you, Rohan, for that incredibly uh, generous, too generous introduction. Here I am uh, in this extraordinary place extraordinary physical place, uh, extraordinary place as a demonstration of what Infosys is and what it can be. 
and that inspires me to try to think a little bit outside of the narrow box of ordinary constitutional thought and try to imagine a little bit what it would mean to translate the ideals of constitutional design into a language for non-specialists. So I'm going to make some experiments here and what I hope you'll do is participate in the experiment, first by correcting me where I go wrong, and second, all of you in the room do something in your lives that is difficult to explain to ordinary people. <laughs> right? I, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, I'm sure it's everybody. So when you try to explain that to other people, you simplify, you experiment. So I'm going to try to do a version of the same thing and please be tolerant of my errors in the process of doing so. So I want to start with a metaphor and it's an imprecise metaphor. And it's the metaphor of a constitution of a society as the operating system of that society. Now superficially it's a very appealing metaphor. There's something that's a general environment, it has ground rules, covers a wide range of cases, different features can be layered in or taken out, there's a fair amount of customizability built into the structure, at least if it's the right kind of operating system. But there's one enormous caveat that differentiates a constitution from an operating system constructed out of machine language. And that is, after every command is issued, an actually existing human being must make a free volitional choice of whether to obey the command. Right? Such a fundamental difference that perhaps my colleagues in my law faculty would say, well, that's why it's not an operating system, Feldman. Abandon the metaphor. But actually, the metaphor, I think, can be tremendously valuable for thinking about both the way it does match and also the way it doesn't precisely match. Now what this means is that much of what is done in constitutional law is within the framework of operating system thinking. We compare best practices, we try to be instrumental and think about what our objectives are, we can recognize similarities and differences, and we can build. And much of the field of constitutional design is focused in that domain and in that space. And if you go into a law school classroom in a constitutional law class anywhere in the world where they're studying that country's constitution, almost everything operates against the backdrop of presumptions about those issues. Not perhaps everything, but perhaps except for the first few days of class, almost everything else. On the other hand, at a very fundamental level, each of those systems is taking for granted what constitutionalists call legitimacy. Legitimacy is the idea that there are some mechanisms which cause ordinary people to follow the commands of the constitutional system and of the legal orders that issue from it further downstream. So legitimacy is a shorthand for that. And lawyers sometimes imprecisely forget to distinguish between two different kinds of legitimacy. One kind of legitimacy is a descriptive concept. It says, look at a system. Are people treating the system as legitimate? Are they obeying because they believe they ought to obey? That's a descriptive question. And you could have a descriptively legitimate system that was morally terrible. Right? Imagine a horrible autocratic government that discriminates, oppresses people, tortures them. But everybody in the society thinks, well, that's the way it's always been around here. That system would be descriptively legitimate. What it would not be would be normatively legitimate. It would not be morally legitimate. And so the second kind of legitimacy is the kind that asks, ought we to listen to the commands of the system? Should we individually, when we think about the system, say, no, I'm not going to obey. Wrong for me. Now, those are two different forms of legitimacy, and notice that we could have normative legitimacy without descriptive legitimacy. We could have a utopia. In a utopia, you ought to obey morally every command of the system, because it's a utopia. That's definitional. In practice, very few people <laughs> make it in a utopia. Utopias tend to crumble very, very quickly. They lack descriptive legitimacy. Of course, in a perfect world, you have overlap both normative and descriptive legitimacy, 
but perfect worlds are hard to find outside of seminar rooms. <laughs> okay, now let me turn to the dimension of religion. Why should religion matter at all in constitutional design? Now, you could imagine a strong normative argument that says, let us leave religion completely out of constitutionalism. The less we have to do with religion, the better off we will be. And you can imagine different versions of this. I'm going to call this idea secularism, although I'm going to expand and describe different subversions of secularism. But for shorthand now, I'm going to refer to secularism as the idea that at the constitutional level, we should exclude religion from our operating system, from our constitutional operating system. So you might imagine what you would call strong secularism that says the reason we should leave religion out of our operating system is that religion is irrational. And maybe religion won't even be offended to be called irrational. I mean, some religions might be, but maybe some religions acknowledge that they're based on faith, based on tradition, based on emotion, based on familial ties, things that are arguably outside the bounds of strict, enlightened reason. So we might say, to make our constitutional structure work well, we'd like to rationalize it. That's intuitive. The more rational, the fewer contradictions, or we'll identify the contradictions we have and we'll resolve them. So by leaving religion out, we'll simplify things. And indeed, this form of strong secularism would go further and might even say, because religion is irrational, we'd be better off without it full stop. Perhaps we shouldn't have religion at all. And there have been some very important strong secularists who believed that. The French revolutionaries who designed the French constitutional order were, for the most part, radical Jacobins who thought that religion was bunk. That's the most polite word you could use for it. And they wanted out of the system completely. And their version of secularism, which they called laïcité, stood for the idea that religion should be suppressed. And in the French Revolution, it wasn't just that religion was left out of the Constitution. The churches were closed. Their property was taken for the state. The priests lost their collars and their privileges. Some liked that, some didn't like it. And the state as a whole took an attitude of contempt towards religion. Indeed, the state tried to replace religion. They threw out the calendar because that was too religious. They created temples of reason. That's not a metaphor. They actually called them temples of reason. That may be a contradiction, but we'll leave that to one side. So that was a radical form of strong secularism that said religion is bad, therefore we want it out of our constitutional order. Now, even though they were French, they couldn't perfectly rationalize their system, though they certainly tried. And so some people remained committed to religion in some way in French Republican ideology. And to this day, laïcité, French-style strong secularism, copes with those people as outliers who can be tolerated insofar as they do not violate the rules that the state sets. So if you're a French schoolchild and you want to wear a Sikh turban or a Muslim hijab or a large cross, the state won't let you do it. And you say, well, but these are my fundamental rights to religious expression. And the state says you don't have a fundamental right to religious expression in our public space because we are a secular system. We've got three big principles, right? Liberty, fraternity, and equality. Notice religion isn't one of them. You lose. Okay, straightforward. And it goes to the court system. The court says, no, no, you've lost. And the French are unapologetic about this. So this is a form of strong secularism with a highly enlightened rationalist approach. And it's one approach to dealing with religion. Notice that in this system, religion is actively subordinated to the state. So there are occasional moments when the French state says, oh, religion, maybe it would be useful to us. For example, we're worried about a large Muslim population that's growing that we can't keep track of. Let's appoint some official leaders of the Muslim community and we're only going to talk to them. Doesn't sound very secular. But from their perspective, as long as the state is in the dominant position and the religious actors are in a subordinated position and the state can choose just how religious they're going to get to be in the conversation, that's okay. Imprecise, but okay. Now imagine a slightly softer form of secularism, which I'm going to call weak secularism or legal secularism. This version says there's nothing wrong with religion per se. If you want to believe it, fine. In fact, maybe for some people, 
belief in faith, in religion, the identity they derive from religion, is the most important aspect of their inner lives. As long as that is relegated to the private sphere and doesn't affect our state and its functioning, we're fine with it. The US model of secularism is roughly this model. It was created by Protestant Christians who believed that faith was a private matter, not a public matter. So it was easy for them to say that the state should distinguish itself and separate itself from the official institutions of religion. So under the US Constitution, the government can't establish a church. It can't coerce you to spend money to support a church. So there's no money and no coercion. And in essence, there's supposed to be no institutional relationship between the state and organized religion. Now, that model doesn't inherently reject the value of religion. It says, I just want to keep my operating system clean. Okay? And because I'm going to keep it clean, I'm just going to separate it out. Every time I see religion, I'm going to marginalize it to my project. But it could be very important to your project. Now, that sounds like an appealing image as well. But it runs into a very practical problem, which is what happens when the model of religion in the society isn't 18th century English-speaking Protestantism, where everybody agrees that religion is properly relegated to the private sphere. What if people come to the country or live in a political community who say, religion is actually the thing that gives my life fundamental identitarian meaning. It defines my community. It defines who I am. It defines my beliefs. I can't relegate it to the private sphere without compromising on my inherent beliefs. That can happen through immigration when a population changes. It can happen through a change in belief because religion is a dynamic force. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Religion today and religion in 25 years will be different even if they think they're the same religion because these are of dynamic evolving systems. Or it can happen if you find yourself in a country where before there's constitutionalism, there's serious committed religious belief. And again, that belief could be faith-based, it could be community-based, it could be familially based. So if you read the textbooks of comparative constitutional law, they only give two forms of secularism. French secularism, strong secularism, and American secularism, weak or legal secularism. But that's a totally inadequate account because of an example that is very well known to all of you in this room, namely Indian secularism, which follows a model that's recognizably and identifiably different from the other two. Now, I think everyone will nod and say, you're right, our secularism is different. But of course, that begs the question of what is Indian secularism? Um, Rowan very kindly said, I like to talk about lots of subjects. I'm not quite dumb enough to come to Bangalore and give you a lecture on Indian secularism. But what I will do is just point to a few notable features visible to an outsider that make Indian secularism markedly distinct as a type from the strong and weak varieties. And I should just say parenthetically, the United States and France do not have the word secular in their constitutions. India does. The Indian constitution specifies that the state is secular. It didn't originally do so. That was added in 1976 in Mrs. Gandhi's small constitution. But when other parts of that constitution were pulled back, secular remained. So did socialists, but I'm not going to. That'll be a topic for another day. <laughs> One must know one's venue. In Indian secularism, we have to acknowledge that the state of India came into existence, the modern state of India came into existence under circumstances where religious identity was an existential issue both for the people who were in the state and for those who formed Pakistan at the same time. So the trauma of partition, which was present already at the moment of the creation of the Indian state, was already a moment not merely inflected, but definitionally specified by religion. And of course, large numbers of Muslims stayed behind in India and were certain to exist in India. Then there was the fact that Hinduism was not conceptualized as a single religion until quite late probably well into the 19th century. In fact, the whole word religion, as I've been deploying it, is essentially a Western concept, which fits very imperfectly with the religious traditions, broadly speaking, of the subcontinent. So what did secularism mean originally in India? It meant many things that are arguably in contradiction with each other. It meant an aspiration for the state to be tolerant of all religions equally, 
everybody would be treated the same way regardless of his or her religion. And it meant some special protections for some people based on their religions. I mean, try programming that one. Right? It's not quite X and then followed by not X, but we're getting close. Right? Then it raises the question of, well, would it be an act of religious invocation in politics as prohibited by uh, Indian election law to say that one should vote for me because I stand for the principles of Hindutva? So the Indian Supreme Court dealt with this issue in 1995 and they said, no, 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 that wouldn't be, it wouldn't be an invocation of religion to say vote for me because I stand for the principles of Hinduism. Why? Because Hinduism is a generic, broad, based terminology that doesn't refer to a specific religious tradition, which would be true unless one were not a Hindu. <laughs> Again, notice the precise difficulty in making sense of secularism in this context. I'll just give you one last concrete example of why Indian secularism is so challenging to, to pin down. I was asked uh, when I lectured in Delhi on this topic, um, one of the people in the audience said, well, you know, what about the aspiration to produce a uniform code of law that on family matters would govern all Indians exactly the same way? What does secularism say about that? Well, I'm putting it a little more politely than the questioner put it. <laughs> and I said, well, look, it depends on your conception of secularism. You could say secularism means treating each person exactly the same as everybody else, so it mandates a uniform code. That's the secular view. Or you could say secularism mandates tolerance of all people based on their religion and equal treatment of all based on their religion and state neutrality towards religion. And some people really care that their family law and their personal status law be governed by their religion. So to treat them equally and neutrally, you can't subject them to the same code. So that's the secular view. I honestly think both of those can be defended. So then the same questioner said, what do you think of pseudo-secularism? So I said, I'm not sure, but I think it's the thing you call the other version of secularism than the one you like. <laughs> okay, so there are at least three, and I think probably just three, competing conceptions of secularism that one could be using. Now I want to turn to a really hard problem and just give you a basic account of how I've thought about trying to solve it and the problems that that putative solution involves. And then I'll open it up. The problem is this. Remember I began by saying that in the operating system that is constitutionalism, individuals have to make the choice at the crucial moment to obey the command. Why do they ever do that? I mean, that's a profound question. Not original to me, I assure, I assure you. But at least part of the answer, not perhaps all of it, but at least part of it is that they experience the constitutional system as expressing their beliefs, desires, and fundamental commitments. That is to say, the constitution reflects the ethos of the people. If it doesn't, then it's imposed on me and I won't follow it. I've seen this, I've seen it in Iraq. Right? The original constitutional structure there, though enacted by Iraqis after elections, happened under de facto US occupation. The legal occupation had ended, but the de facto occupation continued. And Iraqis experienced the constitution not as we, the people, but as something imposed on us. Not every Iraqi, but most Iraqis. If it's not conceived, a constitution is not conceived as internally driven, it will lack legitimacy, descriptively speaking. There are some strange exceptions to this, I should just note. Japan's constitution, strange exception. The US imposed it wrote it in English, back translated into Japanese with grammatical errors, it's still going strong 70 years later. <laughs> I'm just being honest. But for the most part, a constitution ought to express an ethos. So what do you do if the ethos of the people is defined by religion? How can you have a secular constitution on any of these theories of secularism if ordinary people only buy into a constitution if it's got religious content? This problem plagued attempts at democratization in the Muslim world and especially in the Arabic speaking world. Because attempts to impose secular constitutionalism ran roughshod into complexly expressed versions of Islam. There's no single version of Islam that's expressed everywhere in the Muslim world, but everywhere that this was tried, Turkey, Iran, 
not during the Islamic Revolution, but before, there was pushback from the populations, sometimes 50, 60 year pushback. And in the Arab world, it's also been a very great challenge in particular. There, a whole range of challenges existed democratization, but in Tunisia, the only country where the Arab Spring has succeeded, the core debate that arose in the aftermath of the first free elections was, will our constitution be Islamic, and if so, in what sense? And people were in the streets within six weeks. Luckily, very few people were killed, although some were. And a compromise was actually reached, which I'll allude to in a few moments. But this was a central debate. So my instinctive reaction to trying to think about how democracy, democracy and constitutionalism should be possible in formerly undemocratic Muslim countries has been to say, if we can design a constitution that fully respects equal rights for men and women, for Muslims and non-Muslims, for people regardless of religion, and that constitution guarantees the freedom of speech, the freedom from arbitrary arrest, the basic guarantees of due process, then it shouldn't be a problem if the same constitution abandons secularism and just openly says, this is an Islamic state. Now this was based on a gamble. The gamble would be that people would actually adopt an operating system like this and buy into it. And that this would facilitate greater equality, greater peace, and greater democracy. Well, it's happened in exactly one case, namely Tunisia. And the model that was adopted there involved the political Islamists abandoning their traditional request to put Sharia in the Constitution, and adopting instead a liberal Constitution that does say that Islam is the official religion of the state, that preserves space for Islamic politics, but equally guarantees equality of Muslims and non-Muslims, of men and women, and basic rights and liberties. Now, even in the Arab world, Tunisia is seen as a small country. It's 10 million people. You know, that's a very small number of people, I don't mean to tell you. So I don't mean to suggest that it's a model for the rest of the Arab world or the Muslim world. It isn't a model, realistically. Could be, but it probably isn't as a realistic matter. But it shows you that there's at least in principle the possibility of creating an order in which secularism is made secondary. Again, provided equality and basic rights are respected. Now, there are at least two huge problems with this idea, and I'm gonna end by describing them and proposing a possible response. One of those problems is in theory, the other problem is in practice. The theoretical problem is simply this. If the state is definitionally Islamic or definitionally Jewish, as it is in Israel, which claims to be a Jewish and a democratic state in its constitutional documents, then arguably citizens who don't belong to the majority religion will never feel themselves to be full and equal citizens. So there are Palestinian Israelis, that is to say not people living in the West Bank or the occupied territories, but people living in Israel proper with Israeli passports, who will say, I'm a Palestinian and I don't feel fully an equal citizen of the state of Israel because the national anthem sings in Hebrew of a 2,000 year hope to return to the land, but you know, my family actually never left. I can never be a full and equal citizen. That's a genuine and real concern that non-Muslims living in Tunisia would say, well, I'm not a full and equal citizen because the state says it's Islamic. That's the theoretical problem. The practical problem is even if we were to concede that there might be a solution to the theoretical problem, and I'll suggest one in a moment, maybe in practice the state won't treat everybody equally, won't respect the equal rights of minorities. Right, won't treat people as though they fully belong. Even if they could feel that they belonged, they won't in practice be treated that way. Now these are deep and serious problems with sidelining secularism. But there is a response, and I'm gonna conclude with the response, and it goes like this. Democracy has an inevitable and ineluctable component of majoritarianism. You can't have a democracy without majority rule. 
I have had some very brilliant colleagues like Professor Ronald Dworkin, the late Ronald Dworkin at NYU, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life, who redefined democracy so it basically no longer had a component of majoritarianism. Democracy was equal participation under conditions of equal respect. Very philosophically attractive can't possibly be democracy. I mean, words can mean many things, but they can't mean anything. They have to have some designator attached to them. And democracy must have some room for the demos, which is the people, and they have to be able to rule. So majoritarianism creates circumstances where someone's going to lose. It's sort of a painful fact about democracy. We never like to admit it. No one ever says, the great thing about democracy is some people win and some people lose. We say, oh, the people rule, except for the people who don't rule. So this is not a point in favor of democracy particularly, but one of the features of democracy that's most notable and most significant is the fact that somebody loses. And sometimes it's the same people who lose, and they sometimes lose again and again and again. And they may consequently be marginalized. Now a democratic constitution gives those people some protections. It guarantees that the state will treat them equally. It guarantees that their basic rights won't be violated. It doesn't guarantee that they will always win or even ever win on controversial social values and issues. So you can insist on secularism all you like, but it may be that in practice, you can't get buy-in to a constitutional order if you have secularism in some places. The cost of saying we'll do without secularism is that you run the risk of marginalizing some people, minorities, serious, serious risk. But on the other hand, it's democracy itself that already contains that danger. And you know what? A minority in a democratic state knows that he or she is a minority. You never wake up one morning and say, oh my gosh, I, I never knew that I was a minority. <laughs> and that's true in every environment, where, which we can all imagine environments where each of us has been in the minority. No human in our world is always in the majority everywhere. You know it, and it has costs. That said, our commitment to secularism in any of its forms, valuable, important, and significant as I believe that it is, shouldn't be taken for granted. And this is how I'm going to close. It needs to be evaluated and analyzed with respect to the benefits that it brings to the operating system and the costs that it brings in those circumstances and places where we're trying to get people to participate in and obey the operating system. And that, after all, is foundational to the whole idea of a constitutional democracy. Thank you for paying so much attention. Well, sir, thank you. Um, maybe a way to understand this is to choose a less touchy subject, subject than religion, right? Uh, maybe it's only a matter of degree, but language is one more. It's race, religion, and language that divides people into majorities and minorities, right? Uh, are there any lessons, parallels that we can draw from how nations treat uh, the populations in their uh, territories? Can we uh, use similar analogies to address the religious uh, question as well? Well, I, I'm fascinated that you think religion, is, sorry, that religion is a, is a harder question than language. I think the reason that it, language is actually harder is that... I would have said it's less touchy. Okay, less touchy. Sorry, thank you. I can speak four languages at the same time, and I can typically follow only one feed. Good. So here are the two differences. One, as you say, I can speak multiple languages, but it's hard to belong to multiple religions. Not impossible, but hard. On the other hand, I can run a state without a religion but I can't run a state without a language. So you have to pick at least one language. Now you could pick many languages, although that makes it practically challenging, but you have to have at least one language. And I think the experience of countries that are divided by language is in some ways just as challenging as the experience of countries divided by religion. You know, so if one thinks of Belgium or in France, if one thinks of the province of Quebec, now sometimes there's an overlap between religion and language, but we'll leave that to one side. So I think the lessons there are Running two parallel systems simultaneously leads to long-run, simmering tensions. 
It's almost impossible to fully resolve. It's hard to find a settlement with which people are ultimately happy. On the other hand, it's also doable. There are bilingual societies, trilingual societies, and other multilingual societies. Um, so I think that's what I would, what I would say, but I think it's a, it's a genuinely interesting example of, a, of, of something to think about in, in comparison. A particular society, say Hindu society or Islamic society, just to take these two examples, because Turkey, uh, Ataturk uh, imposed a liberal constitution, and in India also the uh, constitution was, uh, again, the, the constitution didn't reflect the majority of people. So after 50, 60 years, we can see that uh, even though it's liberal, you can see that there's a resurgence of uh, Islamic democracy and, 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 and Hindutva here. So wouldn't it be better to reform those uh, societies in line of the traditions? So I, I, I think what you're saying is really interesting. And I think the question of how a society reforms itself is a really interesting one. There have been lots of attempts consistent with the banner of modernity with a capital M to reform quote unquote traditional societies from the top down. And you mentioned a few of them. But the Turkish example is very different than the Indian example. In the Indian example, there were attempts to produce ground up reform and then some constitutional values which to some extent were supposed to trickle down from the top. In Turkey, everything came from the top, from Ataturk. So it was basically, the constitution was not the main actor, the constitution simply embodied what had already happened as a top-down reform. Did it work? I would say mostly not. I mean, in some sense, Turkey may be said to be economically better off than some other majority Muslim countries. In some senses, it's more quote-unquote westernized. But in other senses, people did not give up on their religious values. Maybe they gave up on them for a generation or two, but it began to come back. And, you know, in that sense, it's not clear that you can reform a society in that way from the top down. On the other hand, if you gradually reform a society from the bottom up by voluntary non-governmental transformation, which is ideological and economic and practical, then once you've done that, you can adopt a constitutional structure that reflects the changes that you've made. And I think no one would dispute that that's the, today, that that's a preferable way to engage in projects of reform. The key question though, and the really hard question is, what's the role of the state when you're involved in that process? And the Indian example raises that question very powerfully. Right? Could India have reformed itself without the role of the state? Well, with respect to caste, for example, it's hard to see how that would happen. I don't say it's impossible. That said, it's also true that once the state is involved, there will be certain perverse results of the state's involvement. Because now you're in the realm of politics. And we all know the realm of politics is politicians moving resources around. And once the resources are in play, it's just human nature. It's true in every society in the world. It's the definition of politics that people will try to maximize their share of those resources. Right? And so now the state becomes involved in a process of allocating resources like every state. But that allocation is now along the grounds of caste, let's say, for example, which to some extent gives an ongoing reality to caste, even though the objective is to overcome it completely. So that's a, a deep tension. And I don't have a definitive answer to that question. And I don't think there is a single definitive answer to it. Hi, I would like to know your views on the possibility of the uniform civil code in India. And if yes, would you call that secular? A uniform code could be seen as either secular or anti-secular, depending on your definition of secularism. I mean, if you think that secularism is treating every citizen exactly the same way as every other citizen, irrespective of religion, then a uniform code is secular. If you think, on the other hand, that secularism is treating all religions equally and treating them neutrally, and if different religions have different commitments, and some are completely unbothered by the idea of a uniform code, and others are deeply bothered by a uniform code, right, then it would seem like it was anti-secular to adopt the uniform code. So my answer is that whatever the answer to that question is, we can't answer it by using the word secular. In modern world today, you know, where we are promoting multiculturalism and states or countries are formed by, uh, say, immigrants, for example, Canada, how of uh, law or constitution actually, you know, decide that, the, you know, there is an optimum limit that it's going to be tolerant to uh, in accepting certain uh, religion or, you know, certain beliefs? Law has to decide uh, 
where to draw the line and how do modern constitutional law decide on that? Yeah, that's a very, very deep question. So all of us would have very easy jobs if the world were static. To find the problem, give me enough time, I'm going to solve the problem. Unfortunately, by then, it's a new problem. So that's exactly what you're describing with respect to states that have a high degree of immigration, a high degree of churn in population. So how do we update our values in the light of those changes? And what goes with this, how do we decide who we're going to allow to become citizens? You know, different countries have very different solutions to this. The tests that different countries give for citizenship are radically different. Some give you a citizenship test that asks you historical facts about the country. The American one is like that. They're a little bit random facts, but they ask you about them. Others, um, my best friend lived in the UK because he was company sent into the UK and he worked there for seven years and he decided, okay, I'm in the UK, maybe I should get citizenship. I don't know exactly you know, why he thought that was just so important, but he got it. Um, and in the test they said, what do you do if you're in the pub and you accidentally spill beer on the person next to you in the pub? <laughs> and then there were a list of choices. And two of, two of them, just to give the two, one was um, apologize profusely and offer to pay for the dry cleaning. And another was buy the person another pint. So there was a right and a wrong answer to this question. And whether you were truly a, a subject of the queen depended on your answer to this question. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands of what the answer is. Um, I thought the answer was the third answer, which was ask him to step outside, but you know, that was, <laughs> I think that was the descriptively correct answer, but not the normatively correct answer. So, you know, I think countries, many countries are today struggling. I use this, it's a silly example, but I'm using it in a serious way. Countries are really struggling with how to decide who can become a citizen. Do you have to take on all of our cultural values and ideals? You know, do you have to have the kind of toleration that we have? And there's some, ironically, there's some xenophobic discrimination in these questions that are meant to be tolerant. Right? I mean, you have this in the Dutch example. The Dutch test, you know, asks you some questions about how would you feel if your son came home and said, I'm marrying another man. And if you say, it bothers me, you fail the test. Okay? This is in pursuit of Dutch liberalism and openness. They're trying to keep out of their country people who have a different answer to that question. I mean, you know, this is a serious, it's a serious question. My own view, my own view, just to finish the thought, is that I think that if a state wants to have regular immigration, it should have enough faith in its own ethos and values that it can say to immigrants, here's our history, here are our beliefs and our values. You don't have to believe them. Come on in. You can live here and be a productive member of society. You have to follow the law because everyone has to follow the law. If over time you or more likely your children come to share the views of the society, that will be because those are good and attractive views. And so we hope that that works out. If not, you're free to choose otherwise. That's my own preference. Um, but look, that reflects my own ideals of constitutional values which tend not to rely on the state to make me into a good citizen, because I don't trust the state to do such a good job of it. Uh, thank you all very, very much. This has been great fun. Thank you. Thank you.